Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our High Tunnel Berry Production Webinar Series. Today's topic is choosing berry crops for a high tunnel, strawberries, raspberries, and blackberry. Um, I'm your moderator. Uh, my name is Suzanne Slack. I am an assistant professor at Iowa State University covering commercial fruit crop production. Uh, today, we also have joining us um, Dr. Marvin Pritz and Aaron Wills. So um, Marvin Pritz obtained a BS in biology from Bucknell University in 1978, a master's in biology from the University of South Carolina in 1980, and a PhD in horticulture at Michigan State University working with wild species of blueberries. Marvin came to Cornell in 1984 as the berry crop specialist with an appointment in extension, research, and teaching. He primarily works with production, season extension, and pest management systems in strawberries and raspberries, and has consulted with berry farmers throughout the world. He teaches several courses at Cornell and is a frequent guest lecturer in the local schools and community. Marvin has published more than 75 refereed papers given more than a thousand extension talks. So this can be your 1001 extension talk um, and presented several keynote talks at international conferences. Aaron and his wife, Molly, own and operate Little Hill Berry Farm, a diversified organic berry farm in Northfield, Minnesota, which they started in 2011. Their main berry crops are blueberries, day neutral strawberries and raspberries with a focus on pick your own and farm sales. In addition, they offer pick your own pumpkins and dig your own potatoes, host on-farm dinners, and have a spring plant sale. So um, now that we've introduced our speakers, just a reminder that um, try not to unmute yourselves during the talk. And if you have any questions as we go, you can feel free to put them in the chat or save them till the end. So um, with that, we're going to hear from Marvin first, and I'm going to um, turn it over to him. Thanks, Suzanne. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me get this up here. There you go. So I want to talk about uh, berry crops and high tunnels. And we've had a lot of experience trying out different berry crops in these high tunnels. And I'm just going to share with you uh, my experiences, and maybe it'll be the same as Aaron's, or maybe not, but we'll find out. I don't know what he's going to say, and he doesn't know what I'm going to say. So I, I took this picture a few years ago in California, and the point of this talk was that even in, in mild climates where it hardly ever rains or snows or uh, people are using high tunnels, and now I have to take that back because this year they've gotten hammered out there, uh, but they're probably really glad they have these high tunnels up to protect the raspberries in this case. In our climate, you know, we're dealing with this kind of weather all the time. Uh, and these tunnels give us protection from the rain, they extend our season, reduce uh, wind damage, frost damage, winter damage. So uh, we have a lot of reasons to use them here, uh, probably more so than they do in California. And you know, I would say that California and a lot of places around the world, Spain and so forth, they're using tunnels more than we are in the Midwest and Northeast. So here's just uh, some thornless blackberries. Uh, what happens if you don't protect them for the winter? It's really hard to grow them around here. Uh, so I want to talk today just briefly about each of these crops and what our experience has been with tunnels, with all of them. And uh, let's start with blueberries. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know anybody growing uh, blueberries under tunnels up here, but there are people doing it. And interestingly enough, most of those places are down south. So Florida has growers growing blueberries under tunnels. For And the reason they're doing it is that gives them an earlier season. So it's more of a marketing thing. They get the blueberries up here in the northern markets a little bit sooner. And they get some frost protection from their tunnels. In my experience with blueberries, I rarely, I think one time in my 30-some years, I've seen frost damage on blueberries. Uh, it, they just seem to bloom late enough and they have that flower turned upside down that they don't get damage from the frost so much. And then they have that skin where the rain kind of washes off of them and they tend not to get moldy like, you know, a strawberry or raspberry would. So 
don't know, in my mind, using a high tunnel for blueberry might not be economical up in our climate where we're not really aiming for a particular marketing window in a wholesale market. What about strawberries? Well, strawberries are grown under tunnels in, in various places around the world. And again, I don't know too many people here in the Midwest and Northeast growing strawberries under high tunnels. Uh, do it and they do fine, but you know, high tunnels are fairly expensive to construct. Uh, strawberries aren't really that high of a value crop anymore. The price tends to be low because there's so many strawberries in the market. And there's a lot of space that you're uh, putting under cover and heating and all, and the strawberries are pretty small plant. So pretty big tunnel for a pretty small plant. What I've seen work really well and is catching on, at least in our area, our low tunnels sort of get the same benefits that you would with a high tunnel, but about the fourth of the cost. So this is these work particularly well for day neutral strawberries. You can plant them on, you know, plastic beds in the spring, and they'll start fruiting later on that summer into the fall. And you can use these tunnels, these low tunnels, to cover the plants when it rains and when it gets cold. Pull the tunnels back when it's hot, and by moving them up and down, back and forth. You can regulate the temperature and get quite an extended season and really reduce your disease incidence on strawberries. So we're finding these work better than high tunnels, at least in terms of expense and, and so forth. And it can easily be taken down for the winter and put back up again in the spring. So I give a thumbs up for strawberries, but maybe not so much for high tunnels, but for low tunnels. We have growers that are doing this, uh, marketing to some of the largest supermarket chains here in the Northeast. And you know you can pick strawberries in the snow uh, if you manage it correctly. And we're looking at experiment, we're experimenting with different kinds of covers, uh, pink covers and reflective covers and so forth to try to get the temperature just right so these plants do well. Probably the way this is gonna work best is be, uh, shifting out some of these covers mid-season. Like you use a cover that actually cools the plants in the summertime and then shifting it out with a cover that warms the plants later on in the fall. That would be really hard to do with a high tunnel, but it's easier to do with a low tunnel. And here's some strawberries I picked a few years ago in middle of November under these tunnels. So thumbs up for strawberries. What about summer raspberries? Again, uh, people are using these tunnels for summer raspberries. These are raspberries uh, planted in the ground, covered with a tunnel. They come on early. The fruit quality is high. The yields tend to be higher than they are out in the open field. And if you get a rainy year, you know, the plants are just fine under there. Just a few pictures of some farms around here that I've taken photos of. In this case here, it's like a hay grove tunnel but a lot of people are growing these under the standalone tunnels. One of the trends we're seeing with raspberries, summer raspberries in tunnels is rather than plant them in the ground, plant them in pots instead. And the advantage of that is that the pots can be moved in and out of the tunnel as necessary. So for example, you can grow your summer raspberries in pots. You can uh, move them into a cooler or the winter and then move them out into your tunnel at staggered intervals. So you spread out your season during the summer so they all don't come in at once. And that seems to be the, the trend now is these potted plants that can be moved back and forth. So here's a grower in New York, uh, growing them in pots. Uh, this is up in Canada. Again, you can see they're all grown in pots. Also in pots. So that gives you a lot of flexibility. Another option is to think about uh, fall raspberries, like the, the double cropping raspberries, the ones that fruit in the primocanes. And how do they do? Well, we've had really good luck uh, growing those actually right in the ground. So we plant them in the ground, they grow up put the covering on the tunnel in the summer and that tunnel protects the plants from rain. And then we can drop the sides when it gets cold if we need to. 
and we can pick right up through the fall. And the raspberries love it, and the fruit quality is really high, uh, yields are high, and I think it's a great way to use a tunnel, fall raspberries. These aren't in pots, they aren't moved in and out, they're just planted in the ground. The, normally, we get our frost around here, um, April 5th is our date of first frost in the fall, I'm sorry, October 5th is the date of first frost in the fall. And so if you have raspberries in the open, you know, after October 5th, they're done. But here in these tunnels, you can keep on going and go into November. One of the things that we've figured out we can do with these raspberries is if you put them under a tunnel, they kind of run out of fruiting by the time, and it's still, it's still warm enough under that tunnel that you can still get fruit if you had flowers. But oftentimes they, they're done producing flowers and, and those fruit are ripening and it's only the middle of October. You have some time left where you wish you had some fruit. So what we found you could do is pinch the tips of maybe half your plants in July, early July, and cause them to branch. And you can see here in the photo where we pinched the tip and it sends up these side branches and those flower and fruit, but a little bit later, like two weeks later than the plants that haven't been pinched. So that's a way of spreading that season out and getting pretty good production all through the fall. So your this would be a heritage, for example. They would start fruiting maybe in early. Pinch them. This would be pinching them way back in, in the June, early July. That fruit won't come on until towards the end of September. And it'll give you fruit all the way through October into November. So that's a little trick you can do if you want to grow fall raspberries spread that season out. So here's just a, a photo of on the left, unpinched plants, and on the right, plants that are pinched. See the difference in height. And then these are gonna be later, they'll flower later. One of the things we were worried about is bees. We weren't sure whether we would get good pollination uh, that late in the season, like in late September, the bees are gonna be out. But we found out that yes, the bees love those tunnels. And you can see this photograph, how many bumblebees or inside this tunnel. We don't have any hives close by. They're just coming in and finding that nice warm place. I guess they don't want to die either. They come in there and hang out and uh, pollination is really good. And we get really good yields in mid-October from growing these under tunnels. And, you know, that time of the year, you might get one or two nights where it gets really cold, but then like the next week or two, it's supposed to be nice again. You can put a cover over these plants inside the tunnel and get you through those one or two cold nights and then keep on going. So this was like November 5th, um, still picking nice fruit in these tunnels. Now, one thing I have to warn you about, if you have a tunnel that's completely covered year round and you grow fall raspberries in that tunnel, those canes are gonna get really tall. So on the right, you can see how tall these, these are fall fruiting heritage raspberry plants. They're like nine, nine feet tall because they were grown in a tunnel year round. These out here on the left are grown outdoors and they're sort of like the normal height. So what we found works best with these fall raspberries, if you want to grow them for fall alone, is don't put the cover on your tunnel until June or July. If you put it on really early, yeah, you'll bring the crop on early, but the Canes get really super tall and it's hard to harvest them all. So we wait until early summer to put the cover on. And then uh, we get decent sized canes and decent sized yield and so forth. Number of blackberries, that's one I'm real excited about under tunnels. Normally we can't grow blackberries outside at all. Uh, they die all the time. Even the hardy thornless blackberries die almost back to the ground every year. And so, you know, we got winters the same as you. We got lots of snow. Here's our tunnels. And inside these tunnels, though, are blackberries. And when you grow blackberries in a tunnel, you don't have to have any extra heat. It doesn't matter how cold it gets outside in the wintertime. For some reason, that little thin sheet of plastic over that tunnel gives them enough protection, they can get through that winter without any issues. 
we've we did this for like 10 years in a row and never had any winter injury on these plants inside the tunnel. Um, it's just that sheet of plastic, no extra heat or anything. And they're really productive. And the fruit is huge, it's gigantic, and people just go crazy over it. It sweetens up a little bit better in the tunnel compared to outside. It's a little bit warmer, and the plants just really respond. Here's our uh, yields that we look got from some of these different varieties. And Chester, which is a pretty good variety, triple crown, pretty good. They're giving us really high yields, you know, 30 to 40,000 pounds per acre equivalent. And that's as good as they get, you know, in the Pacific Northwest where these things grow really well outdoors. So we can rival that in terms of yield when we grow them under these tunnels in the ground. It takes about, in our case here, about four years before we get into full production. So it's not something you plant this year and expect to get big harvest next year. It takes a while for these plants to grow and establish. But once they're established, they just keep on going and uh, really, really productive. So a couple of years later, on these blackberries, you can just see the fruit hanging down there. Played around a little bit with different ways of trellising these things to keep them from falling on the ground and maybe spreading them apart a little bit to take advantage of the light in a V before we harvest. But anyway, uh, I give a real big thumbs up for blackberries. I think there's a lot of potential there. There's not a lot of local blackberries on the market. And here's a way you can fill that market niche with some really good fruit, um, Esther and Triple Crown. And the last thing I uh, want to mention are primocane fruiting blackberries. These are relatively new. They're like the primocane fruiting raspberries. The canes come up in the fall, and they, are, they come up in the spring, they flower in the summer, and they fruit in the fall. And then you can just cut them down to the ground. And they've had real good luck with these. Um, they were developed in Arkansas, but out in the Pacific Northwest, they're growing these things in the field and having pretty good luck. They don't have to trellis and prune nearly as much as they do with the regular summer fruiting blackberries. So I thought, hey, let's give them a try. Let's put them in a tunnel and see how they do. So here we got a tunnel full of primocane fruiting blackberries. Now they're not quite as nice to work with as the uh, thornless blackberries because they have thorns. <laughs> uh, but uh, we played around with them to see if we could get some fruit. And here they are, and we manipulated them four different ways. Like we pinched them, we tied them down to the cane and so forth. They flowered like you would expect. Uh, pinching treatments and these tying down treatments. But when all was said and done, the yields weren't nearly as high as they were with the floor cane fruiting blackberries. So like five times more fruit on these fluorocane blackberries. So again, you look at the economics, uh, these primocane blackberries, at least in our experience, aren't gonna pay for themselves. So thumbs down on primocane fruiting blackberries, at least based on our experience. If you go back to the summer fruiting blackberries and do a little bit of economics and make some guesses about costs and all, uh, takes about, $11,000 to get one of these tunnels set up and going. That's quite a bit of money. This would be uh, our tunnels worth you know, 30 feet wide and about 96 feet long. You get about four rows of blackberries in there. And then you got your production costs, your harvest costs. And when you throw it all into a spreadsheet and look at it, you know, it's gonna take you well, down here like five years before you break even because you got all those upfront costs with the tunnel and the irrigation system, the trellises and the plants and all that. But, you know, these things keep on going. So after year five, you know, you, your gross sales, in our case, are about $15,000 a tunnel, but your expenses weren't that much because most of your expenses are upfront. Then after that, you just start accumulating, you know, like a net profit. And so year six and out, um, that profit keeps getting larger and larger because your gross sales are always greater than your expenses. Now, this doesn't include advertising and marketing and things like that, but in general, it seems like a fairly profitable endeavor. 
So we put all this information I just shared with you in this high tunnel production guide that you can download uh, for free. It's up here at the top is the URL and you can copy that and paste it in and uh, download it. And it goes into a lot of detail about construction and plastic types and varieties and things like that. But this is just a big overview of uh, what we've done. So again, a big thumbs up for summer blackberries and raspberries. Uh, those are those are the two that I think are most promising for these tunnels. Thumbs up for strawberries and low tunnels. Not so much for primocane fruiting blackberries and uh, blueberries. So that's uh, what I have to say. I'm anxious to hear what Aaron has to say. And Suzanne, I don't know if you want to take some questions now on mine or wait till Aaron's done. Let's see, does anyone have any burning questions for Marvin before we switch to Aaron? If not, um, we can do them all at the end. No? Oh. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears. And um, so now Aaron is going to talk about his experience. Thank you, Marvin, that was really cool. I love seeing those pictures of blackberries that are the size of like people's hands. I think that's just so awesome. So um, we're gonna turn it over to Aaron now. So Aaron's gonna share his uh, screen. Uh, let's see here. Um, sorry, here, let me uh, get that going. Uh, all right, well, um, thanks, Marvin. That was uh, really interesting. I loved hearing about blackberries because that's something I have been wondering about and don't know anybody in Minnesota who's growing. And so maybe that'll be our next uh, our next tunnelberry crop. Um, so yeah, I'm Aaron Wills. Uh, my wife and I have Little Hillberry Farm in Minnesota. I think just kind of for reference, we're zone 4A maybe kind of a little bit south of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, so I'm gonna start with my experience growing uh, strawberries and these are day neutral strawberries. Uh, so we have grown day neutral strawberries, I think kind of all the ways you can uh, in the open field, using low tunnels, uh, using caterpillar tunnels, which are, for those of you who aren't familiar, are a little bit more of temporary type tunnels, not quite as kind of beefy as high tunnels, usually not so big. Um, and I would say that what we've, you know, what we've sort of ended up with is growing in high tunnels and caterpillar tunnels. We found that growing in the open field, uh, day neutrals, they just get a ton of disease in our area. Um, soft berries, they just don't hold up well with water. And so they really do need to be kind of covered and shielded from the rain. Um, we did try low tunnels when we first started. And we just found in our area, we had a lot of problems with wind, with them kind of blowing over. Um, maybe it's just how we set them up. Um, also, just kind of from a labor standpoint, uh, we had trouble kind of managing the plastic up and down during the season. We were just kind of busy with a lot of other crops. And so kind of how I started to think about it is I had time in April, for instance, to put up a caterpillar tunnel or set that up. And then I didn't have to mess around with the plastic anymore. It was just they were sort of covered and protected. And that just kind of worked better in our situation. Uh, and so we've kind of transitioned to kind of a combination of caterpillar tunnels and a height and high tunnels. Uh, I think some of the benefits of caterpillar tunnels is is kind of similar to the benefits of low tunnels in that they're they're less cost. Um, I'd say they're about a half uh, half the cost of a high tunnel per square foot. Also, you know, as an annual strawberries, you know, we don't have a great rotation crop in a high tunnel. We don't grow vegetables. We're just primarily a berry farm. So with caterpillar tunnels, we can actually move them. And so that's actually what we'll be doing this spring. We're gonna be moving our caterpillar tunnels to a new spot so we can just continue to grow strawberries and we'll grow a cover crop where the caterpillar tunnels were, and then we'll probably kind of rotate back and forth. Um, whereas in a high tunnel, you know, as you can see, here's a picture of our strawberries. You know, we're gonna grow them a couple of years in a row and then 
I'm not quite sure what we're going to do after that. Uh, you know, our experience in terms of yield, just kind of for some reference, um, when we were we when we moved from open field into a protected environment, whether it be caterpillar tunnels or high tunnels, we pretty much tripled our yield. Uh, and so it was just a no brainer. Um, I, I think at least for us growing dangerous strawberries only makes sense in some kind of a, a protected tunnel. Uh, and what, what I would say we've seen with day neutrals is just an incredible demand. You know, in Minnesota, typically June bearing strawberries were grown historically and are still the main time. And you know, they have like a three week strawberry season at the end of June, early July. Whereas now we're providing strawberries from July to usually like early November. Uh, and there's just a huge demand for local strawberries at that time. Uh, I'd say one advantage, you know, in terms of comparing caterpillar tunnels and high tunnels is high tunnels, you can, we feel you can extend the season longer, I would say, um, because of the greater air mass, we can keep it warmer overnight. And the caterpillar tunnels just aren't as kind of tight um, in that regard. So they just seem to get colder. Uh, but I don't know if that's necessarily worth the extra cost, the high tunnel or some of the other uh, limitations. Uh, I think it kind of just depends on your situation. Uh, I did just want to kind of show our system of, of growing Daniel strawberries just really briefly, because I think it's a little different than uh, what other people are doing. So we're using uh, white on black landscape fabric uh, in this picture. And so we burned holes every like foot. That's how we're planting them. And then there's drip tape irrigation underneath. Um, I think the kind of white on black um, plastic is more common of what you see. Um, but in our case, it just is really nice. We can kind of reuse this each year, kind of set it up one time. And you know, it keeps the weeds down, which is obviously what we want, and also keeps the plants cool uh, because when strawberries do get too hot, they definitely uh, yield a little less. Uh, and then, you know, here's kind of a picture of our caterpillar tunnel setup. It looks very similar. The tunnels are are smaller and not as wide. So we don't have as many rows, uh, but we're using this white on black landscape fabric um, as well in here. And yeah, just a picture of the. Of the, of the berries that you get really high quality, beautiful berries and protected tunnels. Uh, I guess moving on to raspberries. Um, this is a pick, we are growing fall bearing raspberries in a high tunnel. Um, the reason we're growing fall and not summer is basically just our farm and kind of the seasons that we have. So we're, our, one of our main crops is blueberries, which we focus on in July. And so just from like a labor standpoint, having summer bearing raspberries just doesn't fit real well. We were looking for a crop that we could kind of add in, in like late August and September. Uh, and so we started to look at raspberries. Um, actually high tunnel production guide that Marvin showed is actually what got me really interested in growing raspberries in a tunnel. Uh, I had heard a lot from growers in Minnesota that spotted wing drosophila, you know, it was a huge challenge in raspberries. And um, that was one of my worries about growing them in the open field. And I was curious if we could, we'd have less pressure in a high tunnel um, and the option we could net it and do exclusion netting if we wanted to, if we had the tunnel, uh, but then also the yields, you know, just being so much higher. Uh, and so that's what definitely what we've found. We um, actually are growing kind of side by side uh, raspberries in a high tunnel and then outside um, as part of a grant that we got to sort of compare yields and kind of production challenges here in Minnesota. And so we found our yields in the high tunnel are about two and a half times greater than what you, than what we get outside. Uh, and, you know, the season starts earlier, it goes longer, just greater yield, even just during the part of the season. Uh, you know, for us, it has been true that we have lower SWD pressure. Uh, why that is exactly is kind of a mystery. If it's the temperatures higher in there and they don't like it. Um, I do also think there's something to the fact that we do use, um, you know, spinosad occasionally and organic spray for SWD. And 
I think the fact that the plants don't get rained on, um, it kind of makes me wonder if it doesn't get washed off. If the, if it like the, the effectiveness of the spray is greater uh, because the plants aren't getting wet in the dew. Um, I don't really know if that's true or not, but uh, that's one one thought I have. Uh, and you know we're using a, a kind of a V trellis, um, also similar to what Marvin showed. You know, right now the the canes are straight up. This is kind of before harvest. Um, earlier in the season, we have the the V open to kind of get the canes uh, more sunlight. Uh, and you know, this is kind of like what it looks like. You know, you're able to keep a pretty nice row, get a pretty nice fruiting wall um, using a V trellis. I, I would it'd say also just, you know, because you just get so much bigger growth, you need a more heavy duty trellis in a tunnel that we found to just kind of like keep it managed uh, so it doesn't go uh, kind of overboard. Uh, yeah, here's just a couple other, you know, pictures of uh, the fruit. Uh, you know, it's just significantly larger, I have I would say I've found, and you just have very little mold issues in the tunnel. Um, also, uh, we have Japanese beetles in Minnesota right now, which have become kind of a problem, and they don't really go in the tunnel, which is also nice. Um, so, for whatever reason, we just have less insect pressure in a tunnel, um, which, you know, as an organic grower is uh, wonderful. <laughs> um, you know, one of the questions that uh, I think whoever the organizers here of the webinar wanted me to kind of answer is if there's one I like better, you know, strawberries versus raspberries um, in a tunnel. And I guess, you know, we I like them both. I mean, we're growing them both in tunnels and I think they're really great crops. If I could only do one, I would I would grow day neutral strawberries um, just because the demand from customers is just really significant and the quality of the berries, they just, they taste so good. Um, our experience is that in a high tunnel, we can get about a pound of fruit per plant, maybe even a little bit higher in strawberries. And, you know, we're charging like $9 a pound for strawberries. So, you know, we're at about like $17,000, you know, roughly um, of yield out of a high tunnel in strawberries. Raspberries, you know, it, it comes to about 12 or 13. So the economics are probably a little better about there's, you know, there's different factors there in terms of like seasonality and um, customer demand. Uh, but, you know, I think for us, like we could grow raspberries outside and still do it success successfully. Um, however, we couldn't grow strawberries outside. We need some kind of protection, um, whether that is a low tunnel or caterpillar tunnel or high tunnel, and we need something. Um, so, we are doing it more strawberries, more in caterpillar tunnels. Um, and I think that's kind of probably a long, our long range plan and, and using high tunnels for raspberries or some, some other crop. Um, you know, in terms of challenges, just kind of like thinking back of what we've seen, um, you know, one of the challenges I think is just like for someone who grows crops outside too, it's just like managing fertility and nutrition. So, you know, we weren't really used to that in the beginning. And so learning about like fertigation and how to provide nutrients through our drip system um, made a really big difference in the health of the plants, uh, which is not something we were, you know, we were doing traditionally just our outdoor rows. So I would just say, if it's something you're thinking about like managing nutrition um, and fertility is really important and how you're gonna do that. Uh, I guess I just wanna briefly mention blackberries, which is something we're not doing, like I said before, and um, it seems like it's really appealing. Uh, so hope to learn, hope to learn more about that. Um, and that's kind of what I've got and, you know, could be happy to answer specific questions that people have. Thanks, Aaron, for sharing that with us. 
Um, real quick before we um, start questions. So while everyone's um, thinking of their questions for speakers, we have a poll that we do at the end of our webinars. So I'm gonna post that. And if you wouldn't mind um, filling it out, that'll help us uh, figure out what, we, what was good, what was bad, all the nitty gritty details. So I'm gonna share it now. So there's four questions, uh, please fill it out. Um, and then we'll start with questions. Couple more seconds. Thanks to everyone who filled it out. Awesome. Thanks. So let's let's start with questions. So feel free to put them in the chat. So we have one here. Um, are there any variety recommendations for fluorocane blackberries in a high tunnel? We've had good luck with Chester and Triple Crown. They're thornless, they're productive. Uh, Triple Crown particularly tastes pretty good. Um, so those would be the two that I would go with. I don't think of, I can't think of any other varieties that would be better than those two at this point in time. Um, thanks for answering the question. So another question. Um, so Aaron, what varieties of strawberries and raspberries are you growing in your high tunnels? For strawberries, we're growing Albion and Monterey. Um, we've tried others. Um, Portola uh, is another option. It's, it's very productive. Uh, I don't think the flavor is as good. So that's why we don't grow it. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Seascape is another one that we've grown. Flavor is really good. Um, the berry size is, is, is not as good. It's just kind of get, it doesn't hold size as well. And it's not as productive. Um, so Monterey and Albion have both been very productive and the flavor is great for us. Uh, did you say also raspberries? Yep, also raspberries. Uh, yeah, so raspberries, um, we're growing Anne as a yellow raspberry. Uh, we're growing Joan Jay, um, which has done well for us. It's thornless. It is a little bit of a floppier variety, I would say. But if you have a good trellis, it's helpful. Um, see, we are growing uh, the two Cornell varieties. Now I'm Crimson, uh, Crimson Treasure and Crimson Knight. Uh, Crimson Knight uh, has been really good for us. Um, uh, Crimson Treasure doesn't work as well for us. We just don't have as long enough of a season. Um, so the two that we, we like at this point are Crimson Treasure, or excuse me, Crimson Knight and uh, Joan Jay for red. Marvin, do you have any thoughts on cultivars? I would agree that Albion uh, for us has been the all around better performer, maybe not as productive as some of the others, but when you take into account, you know, shape and size and flavor and color and consumer preference, it's at the top of the list, I think for us. And Seascape's also really good. I would agree Portola is not quite as tasty um, as the other. 
Um, so are there, um, next question is about spotted wing, one of our favorite topics, uh, small fruit topics. Um, how are either of you dealing with spotted wing? And if so, uh, how Aaron mentioned his experience a little bit with control and tunnels, but in general, how, how is it with controlling spotted wing and tunnels? I will say I've been to a couple of places where I could literally see the adult flies on the inside trying to get out of the tunnels on the netting. Um, so sometimes I feel it works really great. Other times it does not from my experience, uh, but I'm curious about your guys' experience too. I think in general, there's fewer in a tunnel than outside. I think it's because it's drier in there, but you also have to really stay on top of the harvesting and not let the fruit get overripe. And uh, cause that's where they really kind of hang out and multiply. So, um, and it's really hard to spray inside a, a tunnel. We've played around with, you know, hooking up like, like an in irrigation system above the canopy so we could inject our insecticide through the irrigation system. It would spray down on top of the plant. So we wouldn't have to go in there and mechanically try to spray and, you know, those things are all really tough to do. I think the best thing to do is keep the planting as thinned out as possible and keep the fruit harvested as, you know, every day or every other day. And then, you know, the other little trick you can use is put it in the cooler for a day or so, and it kills those little buggers. And then even though they're in the fruit, the consumers don't notice it. So those are my, those are my suggestions. Aaron, I don't know what you think. Uh, I, I mean, I think you're right on, uh, Marvin. Uh, it is hard to spray in a tunnel. Um, uh, I would say so for like raspberries, I kind of alluded to, we just, we definitely see quite a bit less pressure inside the tunnel versus outside. I mean, spotted wing in our area love raspberries. I mean, I think it's their favorite fruit. Um, and you know, it, it makes a huge difference uh, how well you harvest. And we harvest raspberries every other day, like clockwork and you know, you just got to keep your field clean, you know, and not have overripe fruit. Uh, we don't really have much pressure of spotted wing on dangerous strawberries. Um, I don't, I don't really know why, honestly. Uh, it's so it's just, it's never, we don't, we don't, don't really do much for it. Um, again, we do harvest uh, three times a week in strawberries uh, and keep it pretty picked. So I would say we haven't seen as much, uh, we haven't had as much of a challenge of uh, spotted wing on, on dangerous strawberries. Uh, I would agree. We don't see it on dangerous strawberries hardly at all. We don't spray for it. We just keep the field picked. And that for, I think you know, they prefer raspberries more than strawberries, that's for sure. I mean, maybe it's because we have both raspberries and strawberries and they just all hang out in their, in their raspberries and they just leave the strawberries alone. Have either of you noticed them? Like we just talked about they prefer raspberries over strawberries. Do either of you have experience with them preferring something else even more than raspberries? Or is that kind of like their favorite? I'm not seeing anything they like more than raspberries. I mean, blackberries are probably close uh, second, but uh, they just really love raspberries. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's raspberries <laughs> um, do we do we have any other uh questions for marvin or aaron i have a question for aaron so when you're growing your fall raspberries in your tunnel do you try to close it down say in april to like really warm things up and get those kings started early or do you still kind of leave the sides up and let the kings develop naturally uh, we close it up, uh, around April and start soaking the soil to like, kind of wake them up and get them going. Uh, it's, it seems to work pretty well from us. Uh, they, they get tall in the high tunnel. They don't seem to get as tall as, as what you showed in your picture. So we haven't had a problem with them getting too tall. Uh, I will say I haven't really thought of the pinching thing that you mentioned, and that, that seemed like a really interesting uh, and cool idea that I think we would probably experiment with a little bit. Uh, 
Um, well, uh, unless anyone else has a question, I think I think that was great. Um, I can't think of any other questions that I have. Uh, the V trellis looked really cool. Your guys' cultivars recommendations were very similar to what I've seen other people do and have success with. So I, I will mention I love seascapes, but yeah, I wish they were a little bigger. They're, they're probably one of the tastiest strawberries, but they're just so small. I was just, I did just remember, I forgot that we also grow polana in our high tunnel, um, which is an earlier variety. Uh, and that's done, done pretty well for us uh, too. Uh, I don't, I don't love the flavor quite as much, uh, but it is very productive. Great. Well, um, I think I think that's it. So uh, everyone, thank you for coming and thank you, Marvin and Aaron, for your great presentation. Uh, well, so this will be available um, online and we have um, also wanted to thank, I forgot to do this before, but uh, I wanted to thank uh, UW Madison Extension, University of Minnesota Extension, uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign Extension, and Iowa State University Extension for putting this webinar series on. And we have three upcoming webinars left in our berry uh, course, day neutral strawberries, brambles, and then controlling the environment in a high tunnel. And uh, you can find the links for that, those the same place you found the link for this one. So thank you everyone and we'll see you next time.